Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> this is our next speaker. Our next speaker of the evening is Neil. And um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's it. Fine, I'm going in. <laughs> <laughs> so Neil sees the infinite possibilities in everything and everyone, and that's all true. Yeah. That's Especially if there's Jeff involved. Yeah. Jeff okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I'm introducing myself, I am Jeff McKay, magical child. <laughs> That's to me, that is my med medicine name. Jeff McKay, magical child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we decided that Jaffa cakes were very attractive. Yes. The other day. So, yes. He describes himself as a magical child. I'm already getting magical child bags. Um, and he believes that we all face blocks, wounds, and traumas and resistances that we must heal um, and love and cherish. Um, and we thrive alongside. Uh, and thrive alongside our inner magical child. Did I say that well? Can we That's vlog that a little uh, bit? Um, I think I think it should have said we need to love and heal our inner child. Yes. Um, as a master healer, Neil has gone through quite a journey. I can't wait <laughs> to share this journey with you. Um, it's a, it was a real journey of self-discovery as well to, to find that place of, of peace and, and stillness. Um, he believes in living a life to the full, the fullest, um, and he wants to uh, live an empowered life and empower others too. And he's been studying um, creative healing arts for six years. Not a long time, really, no. No, I think so. Um, and has fully integrated the healing arts into his life, into his way of being. And it's really influenced how you, you've chosen to, to live your life over the last uh, six years, yeah. certainly. He, he, he says that um, this, this integration into his personal history of, of the healing arts has led him to a great self-belief, um, he, he, um, which he believes is the, the purest form of love that radiates from within. Neil works with people of all ages um, and he shares his wisdom, intuition and I've journey. Dogs. Wow. dogs, cats, I've humans. done horses. Horses, yeah. that's new. Well, I've had a medical intervention with a horse, let's put it that way. I don't want that to come across. <laughs> 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 no, 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 awareness and self-actualization you can follow him on all of the fabulous channels and social media platforms um, and you can check out his website as well at uh, neilchristie.com it gives me a great pleasure to uh gives me great pleasure to welcome neil uh to amplify your voice can we give a big round of applause thank you thank you for that lovely introduction amanda hello everybody in um, Zoom land as well. Nice to have you all here. So I've not prepared much, but I've brought stuff because I generally sort of deviate and shift and change. As my partner Nicholas will tell you, I change what I do a lot. And I love it. It's one of my absolute strengths. But um, sometimes if we make too many changes, well, we're going to go with it. We're going to be fine. I'm going to talk to my healing journey and explain what happened and I always start my healing journey from the moment when I laid down in London in a new flat that I'd had to move into and I said to myself please let me still have a connection to my soul and then I laid down on the bed it was Christmas time I had Christmas decorations all over the bedroom I lived in that bedroom 
and I found a YouTube video, Open Your Third Eye Meditation, and I went, oh, well, here we go, right, and then I just put it on and laid down. Well, what a journey that took me on the first time. It was so impressive for my life and moving forward. Um, it really did change everything. That journey was quite a trip. It was a real sort of um, shamanic journey, astral travel. I went into what I now know as non-ordinary reality, which is where you go for your dream time. It's where you actually feel everything that's happening within you. And I was presented with lots and lots of images. But the most impressive one was being in the stars with this lady in a blue veil and she said, and I, at the time, I couldn't remember the words exactly, Oma Parajitaya Nama, he can come in now. And then she waved a hand through the black night sky. Then after that, I saw a bright blue angel holding a crystal waiting at the bedroom door. This is all with my eyes closed. Then there was a, but definitely, you know when, your body's responding to these journeys, right? It's like when you respond to dreams. And then that in angel um, just kind of flew away. I went, wow, what was that? Okay, then. Um, I was drinking at the time, so I was like, well, maybe it's just one of those hungover daydreams. <laughs> and the next day, I went out walking to go to work. And there was a phone box with a poster on it, let's meditate, come to this free meditation session. And I looked at it and my first response was, oh my God, they're all sitting there cross-legged doing yoga. I want to do something, but I don't think I'm ready to go and sit there and be all yummy doing yoga. So I walked past it and the second day I walked past it again. And then I thought to myself, oh, there's live music. Because it said there's a live band on and you get to do some mantras. And I thought, lovely. I went to theatre school, I love singing, I love music and art, so I said, right, okay, that's got me. So I took my friend with me on the Sunday, the night before, I had been performing in a burlesque bar, DJing in drag, where there's um, girls coming on, taking their clothes off and, and having a dance. It was brilliant. What a bloody great time in London. So I turned up to this meditation session, like glittery eyes, mascara still running down my face <laughs> and sort of probably you don't ever smell it on yourself at the time but reeking of tequila and I was sitting <laughs> there with my friend and I was like I really did enjoy the live music that was like a, a great thing there was a band called Ananda who were on mm -hmm. and it was an all-male band and they sat there with a harmonium it was so peaceful and they did some mantras and they were chanting these mantras and they were just, I was like, oh my God, yeah, this is what I asked for, you know, where is my soul connection? I've got to follow this. And then at the end of the concert, they said, okay, everybody, we want you to join in with this mantra. This is one for you all to join in with. The words to the mantra are, Oma Paraji Tayanama. And I was like, <laughs> where's the man with the camera you know how would they know that I'd heard that in the sort of daydream meditation thing that I did when I fell asleep on my bed and then we sang it and it was amazing and then I told the guys at the end and they were just like quite nonchalant about it as if it happens all the time every day so I kept going to those meditation classes and they were really, really lovely meditation classes. It was with the Sri Chinmoy Centre in London and I got to go there twice a week and we did weekend retreats. We went away singing in different countries. I had such an opportunity to connect with people. The rules were no drink, no sex and no mate. And when they told us the rules, I was like, I don't really care. This feeling of meditation that I'm getting is worth so much more than any of those things have ever given me in my life. So very quickly, I gave up drinking almost at the drop of a hat. I gave up sex because I wasn't having any anyway. So that just, <laughs> that was like a no-goer. 
And then the meat, I was like, can you eat fish? And the lady in the meditation class said, well, fish is still like a bit of a, it gives you a bit of a um, dull, dulling to your consciousness. So I said, oh, but we're okay then. <laughs> right, I'll give up fish as well. So I did. And for three years, I was in that meditation centre, having a wonderful, wonderful time. Now, how I'd ended up getting into that flat that I got into was very dramatic because I was living with a guy there in London and we were having a very violent relationship. I was physical abuse in that relationship. There was so much mental abuse. There was so much um, fear for me in that relationship as well. It was very codependent relationship on alcohol and substances. And for me to stay safe, feeling safe, I stayed in that relationship for five years because I needed to feel safe and I needed somewhere to be. I needed a roof over my head. I was in London and I was not moving back to Darlington at the time. I was just not at that point in my life. So one night, the end of that relationship was really violent, really, really catastrophic. I was out of the house and the police were all coming along and everything like that. There was blood, there was all sorts. It was really bad. And I ended up in a friend's house, then I ended up in this house in Waterloo. So that feeling of safety and needing to be safe kept me in that relationship. Also, the pure belief that anybody and anything can be loved. See, the love of a child is believing that no matter where you are or who you are, your superpower or my superpower of a child is love. And holding on to that, believing that I can love into the darkest places and believing in love. And that's what love was. I gave a lot and it was a big sacrifice. I don't have to do that anymore. And that's part of my journey of the healing process as well that I went through. So moving into this lovely, beautiful land, you know, the girls are in the meditation centre on one side wearing sari, all the boys come in wearing white sitting on the other side, and me having moon and rising Sagittarius, which is about loving philosophy. Philosophy keeps me comforted at night. Philosophy is how I go out and explore the world. So being in a meditation centre, books, 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 books everywhere, sit down singing songs, chanting, everybody had a dinner at the end of the meditation. It was so safe. It was unreal. This place was just pure safety. And all I had to do was do what I asked for, and that was connect with my soul. And now when I was a child, I was always connected to this kind of work. When I was about 13, I would be reading tarot cards to the neighbours. And when I was 12 years old, I was taking books out of the library on self-hypnosis. So I loved it then. And then there was a cut-off. And then there was this whole trial of life, this whole experience of being through, going through the fire, going through the fire. Yet doing it nonchalantly, like a fool, not realising that what I was going through was not a happy life. Just not realising that until I got to this place of safety. And then I was, I remember the meditation classes, one of the first questions they asked was, can you remember a time when you felt really happy? Dead easy question. I was like, oh, I sat there for ages and I picked a time when I was in Kuala Lumpur, drunk on the side of a street, singing karaoke in a karaoke bar, because I was quite happy there doing that. Um, but something happened with the meditation that kind of injected a new sense of what love is as well. And when I ended up in the ashram in New York, I was visiting there for a couple of weeks just these huge messages messages came in that you know love isn't always physical there isn't a physical you can be loved 
this beautifully without even having anybody present with you. You can feel this sense of love. Since I started going to that meditation centre, this opening of the heart and this sort of fullness of spiritual love started just to drain through me and drain through all aspects of my life. And so people at work would be saying, yeah, Neil, what happened to you in November? You started to be nice all of a sudden. I said, oh, I started meditating and like it was just the best thing ever. And so the safety there was amazing. So I spent like three, three years there in that safety. Now, after three years, I had this huge um, trauma revisiting of a trauma. So I was sitting there after my regular morning meditation and then I had three flashbacks. One was being abused sexually. One, the next one was asking that person not to have sex anymore, just wanting to have a friendship, not wanting to do that. That person responded to me by saying, that means you don't love me. The next one was another flashback of sexual activity with that person. Boom. I'd been holding that inside me, the right moment for it all to appear. I was in a strong place. I was in a safe place. And I was really level-headed, you know, with everything. I was ready for it. But still, a huge shock to be represented with those things that have actually happened to you in your life. Most of you, can, we carry things around with us that are under the carpet, literally. We carry so much with us that's under the carpet. And we don't believe that it really had anything to do with how we are. Or it didn't have anything to do with shaping us, but it does. You'll only find out when that carpet's ready to be rolled back, when it's safe. And that was what I'd had for those three years, that safety. And so then I made some phone calls here and there, and that began a criminal um, justice process, which went on for four years. Four years of waiting for something to happen. It was an incredible journey. Before I went into that journey, I was reciting a poem over and over to me, which was one of um, Sri Chinmoy's songs. It was really incredible and so empowering to help me go through and begin that process of being tested because I was being tested on what I was saying. It was massively harrowing to go through and put dates and put events and times to make the facts that appear to you, you know, into a report her horrendous. So this was the um, song that got me into it. I shall enter into my heart's citadel city. I am a worshipper of the fire god. I am a lover of the fire god. I have blossomed today into the melody of fiery flames. The bondage of possession greed, the iron control of dark attachment, the torture of penury, the pangs of my shattered dreams have at last disappeared in a twinkling into the farthest remote unknown. On my infinite lap, the infinite is swimming. The ever intoxicating and ever energizing flute of Sri Krishna is the very origin of my life's journey. The destruction dance of the great Lord Shiva ushers in a new creation, encircling fast my earthbound life. I just listen to it over and over again. And, you know, you get shaped when you're about to go and give this. It's like, it's definitely revisiting because you have to go back and you have to go over everything. You have to go over everything many, many, many times. So it is quite harrowing. There's support centres out there. One of my support centres was called Survivors, Survivors UK, who work with male um, survivors of sexual abuse. 
they were great. They give you an independent sexual advisor to go with you for the appointments, but still, it's the constant scratching around in your head to feel that you're delivering the right thing. You know it's the truth, but you know it's going to be judged and tried. So that raised the question for me, what is justice for me? What was justice for me about this? Because to me, justice didn't mean sitting in front of a jury and having them tell me that what I said was true. Justice was shining a light on what somebody had done so that they can't do it again. That's uh, keeping other people safe. But justice for me wasn't about going into that criminal justice process. If it was doing anything, it was pulling my, pulling my world apart and I could feel that. But I knew there was a sense of justice that had to be had by actually making sure that people who do that are shown and can't do it again. You know? So I dropped the criminal justice case and continued with uh, a different route for making sure that said person couldn't do what they were doing again. One of the most influential pieces of um, literature that I was going through at that time was called A Course in Miracles. Now there's a beautiful page in A Course in Miracles which is about forgiveness and it's completely understandable and it's a really beautiful passage. It's, I offer you the Holy Spirit as a part of myself. I know that you will be released unless I wish to use you to imprison myself. In the name of my freedom, I choose your release. I know we will be released together. It's powerful. And I think it was the moment of, am I using this to imprison myself? Everything just unspiraled. It's like a bird cage that just crumbled down and opened out. And I could move on and I could be um, really working with more things that were bringing me joy in my life again. So by this point, I'd left the meditation centre because I wanted to get into a relationship. So I said, basically, look, I've had a great time. We've done loads of stuff. It's been wonderful. But now I'm ready to go out and, you know, get a boyfriend and have a nice time and get into a relationship. And I can't sit there meditating with you all, knowing that I'm actually going to be out there, you know, trying try to, to hook up to, to express myself in a relationship. So that was it. That was the end of that was the end of the meditation center, but not the end of my spiritual journey by any stretch of the imagination, because my new love of working with sound and the healing arts had turned into me training as a gong practitioner. Now, working with sound for me was just awe-inspiring and releasing. Because sound has no words, there's no fear of what the sound you're making, that there's no fear of the sound that you're making being misinterpreted or broken down or used as an evidence. A sound is a sound. And so I expressed myself hugely through sound for years. Sound can mean as much or as little anyone who receives it and yet it is true because it exists found that gong in well paid for it in London in a fab antique shop on Portobello Road. So that's what took me into my journey with sound and into sound healing. And not only that, but that led me into taking courses 
was expressing myself and rediscovering my whole whole self through sound and through non-ordinary states of consciousness and being. So I went to study shamanic, I went to do a shamanic apprenticeship and the shamanic apprenticeship was incredible. In shamanism, you use um, a very simple map of um, in non-ordinary reality. So it's close your eyes, picture the tree, the tree of life. The roots of the tree of life are where your ancestors' wisdom lies. The center of the tree of life is where the day-to-day -day guidance that we receive from everybody lies. And the leaves and the branches of the tree are where your higher wisdom and higher inspirations lie. Now, on a shamanic journey, we use drumming to get you to go to any tree that you know of, a real tree. And when you're at the tree, we might do one if we've got time. When you're at the tree, you allow your imagination to connect in whatever way you connect to guidance. So when you connect to guidance, your guidance might appear as an animal that appears to you at the tree. It could come to you as colours or flowers around the tree. It could come to you as angelic guidance from the upper realms. It could come to you as anything that you perceive as a guiding voice. And that was wonderful. Yeah, so that's really, that, that was very um, incredible journey that I did in Dartmoor with a lady called, a witch called Susie Crockford and a group of Druids. I met so many different people over my time since I've been on my spiritual reconnection that it's just been amazing. Um, then after that, I went to study with a guy called Leo Rutherford, who's amazing. He teaches the medicine wheel. Now the medicine wheel is an amazing map of four corners, and each direction has attached to it an element. Each element has a stage of life. Each stage of life has a season of the year. Anything that you can divide into four, basically. So the basic medicine wheel that we started with was the East being the magical child, the sun, and this is North American shamanism. There are different directions and attributions in paganism. To North American shamanism. So the East was the magical child, the sun, how you shine out. And also the magical child, my favourite, is the belief that you can do or become anything that you want. Because when we're children, anything that we believe, we really believe can happen and we can make it happen. And then in the south, which is the water, you've got the wounded child, which is the part of us that doesn't understand why things are happening the way they're happening. And therefore, we develop an emotion. There is a motion of searching for why is it happening. That can come out for you as tears, excitement. It can come out as a grieving. It's the question, why is this happening? So that's when the child can't quite grasp what it is that you're trying to grasp. And just like a tree has rings, we have all of these elements still inside us. We just have to connect to find the medicine of each part. Over to the West is the manifesting adult, the adult that makes things happen. So that part is opposite the magical child. So as we grow up and we cross the, go across to make our magical dreams happen, we meet with the adult who knows what needs to be done to make things happen and also knows that some things aren't able to happen. So we lose a little bit, but we gain a little bit. And at the top, <clears throat> opposite the wounded child, we have the seeking adult. So this is your spiritual seeking side who is looking for higher perspectives to answer those questions. Now, the magic of journeying with the medicine wheel is that you can go to visit any of those aspects of yourself and take a question with you. 
and you receive answers, you bring them all back and then you journal, you write them, you, you put them down. And it's a wonderful way to, um, to explore yourself, you know, and the journey to connecting to the magical child is not an easy one. It's not at all, because on that pathway, going back through what's happened during the way, if you may, you've been abused, you've gone through trials, mm -hmm. you've been beaten up, you've been called names for being who you want to be, you've been questioned and quizzed and rejected, you've had all of that before you get back to that magical child. And when you've connected with it, you don't want to let go, it's a constant communication. And it's also whatever we're looking to achieve, I believe we see that we feel that everyone else is trying to achieve the same thing, right? If we're trying to get something, say we're at the in Asda and we're going to the reduced section, we think that everybody in that supermarket is trying to get to the reduced section, <laughs> the Jaffa cake. We're all trying to get to the Jaffa cake. <laughs> so I see each and every person as being on a similar journey. I see the magical child within them, but I also honour the process of getting there. And I know how difficult it is and what a trial it is to get through to that part. But I know how incredible and liberating it is. There's a lot of inauthentic Inauthenticity for me as well came from a place of surviving still and being safe. So for many, many, many years, I was doing a job that just wasn't me at all. I'm grateful to it because it gave me the money to train and get things. But I mean, I was sitting in a suit being a business manager in a school for about 20, 15 years in two different schools. And do you know who pointed it out and said that it was inauthentic? barrister at the trial I would buy that man a drink because he was absolutely right he said we know you as this extravagant drag queen who's been on come dine with me and you behave like this and you dress like this yet here we see you sitting in a suit and tie being a business manager can you explain to us what happened in between you <laughs> being the drag queen on come dine with me and sitting there in a shirt and tie because it doesn't make sense. I said, oh, I started meditating and I stopped drinking. I wasn't about to lay my pearls before swine and give them the full spiritual awakening stuff away. Um, because that was just, that that's too pressure to, to, to lay down there. But that was the most interesting question that came out of that. What happened? So we can show you said come dine with me click on the computer pad there because I've got it up and ready and you can have a little watch and a little see. Um, this is obviously my edited version because the full version, I, you know, they, they had me being full Ooh. bitch, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a slight bitch here. This is about 20 years ago oh, sorry. Before, before lots have changed. So. <laughs> Oh, Just a technical error. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Here we go. That is it. Here we go. But this is what they'd obviously watched before I came into the room. And what they were expecting to walk in was Karma Miranda. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have disappointed them slightly. <laughs> Well, when I press play on it, it um, it does a thing. Okay. I just. Twenty-seven-year-old professional drag queen Neil Christie who divides his time between Ibiza and Darlington. <laughs> Make an opinion on somebody when I first meet them, and then it will come out what I really think of them. I did a lot of the main 
He just got a laugh with the flower or something like you ate at three o'clock in the morning when you rolled out of the pub and you're really drunk and you're on your way home and you normally throw it up down the side of your bed in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> a bottle of cheap cider. Nice touch, Neil. Hello. Hello, How are you? How are you? I'm Dave. I'm Neil. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hello. Come here. So, oh, that's great. The people while he's not to know oh, yeah. that's one thing at least that's great yeah. Yeah. Um, very floral very nice mm -hmm. they're absolutely beautiful lucky that um, not your hand by the way there's no future but i think it's because she's going to i think actually in the hour of it then Natalie talks about politics all the time, that's all she goes on about, and I can't stand that. But it's not, the field blends black politics and philosophy with the body. It's not that. Mm -hmm. I think I've blended up a film there. It's like dog poo. I think I've been positive. food technology when I was at school. Well, I'm experienced, <laughs> and the results I achieved for a two-year course was a D. Very reassuring. <laughs> I'm just thinking it's perhaps the alternate them in a huge popcorn bag with olive oil and chilies, hoping they'll absorb the buttery popcorn bit. Perhaps they don't sell them on the side in starting. They to them a bit of I don't know if you can the knowledge of that there. Now, seriously, please don't try to do that. I can carry out the top line. The normal comes out. Actually, it's all connected. I'm going to go to the next one. 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 I'm going I just asked, did you win? <laughs> no, okay, so well done. That seems like um, a completely different lifetime, yeah. honestly. It just seems like an absolutely different lifetime. And yeah, I feel much more in control of my life in so many, many ways from the journey that I've gone on to come to being, you know, completely ready to share with everybody on every level there was lots of barriers about connecting with people i couldn't do it i couldn't sit in a room full of strangers and talk to anybody it was too difficult because in the back of my mind was always none of you have gone through what i've gone what i've gone through and i've resolved everything that i've gone through so i can now connect with everybody and all parts of all people and I love that my life has just expanded so much and it's all been through spiritual development and now I've moved into clinical hypnotherapy with Amanda which has given me so many answers and reasons as to what I've gone through from a clinical perspective and I'm like Oh my God, so all of this is happening because of all of this and it's just matching everything together and it's given me the skill to be able to share it with others in a journey to reconnect, to resolve and to reclaim what is a big life experience, to reclaim all life experience and hold it in a place of power and strength for yourself. And that leads me to going to get married. 
and this is my lovely fiance I'm going to get married with next month, can't wait. <laughs> who is just gorgeous, safe and loving, and it's everything that I want. So, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions?